straight ahead on Law and Crime Daily. An accused serial killer is trying to represent himself. The DNA used to catch him and the evidence he says clears his name. Police officers in Rochester, New York, accused of pepper spraying a nine-year-old girl. What led up to this incident and the response afterwards? Plus, a black man shot and killed by an Atlanta police officer. Why the prosecutor of the Rayshard Brooks case now wants the trial moved out of her county. And from escaped inmates to captured fugitives, the tip that led Arizona law enforcement to their wanted men. Law and Crime Daily, covering court cases from coast to coast. Welcome everybody to Law and Crime Daily. I'm Jesse Weber, along with Brian Buckmeyer and Terry Austin. Only a snowstorm would keep Brian out of the studio, so I hope everyone doesn't mind me filling in for today, but let's get started. A suspected serial killer in Florida is trying to get one of his cases thrown out, and he's doing it by himself. And Jeanette Levy is here with details on that request. Yeah, Jesse, this is the 13-page handwritten motion that Robert Hayes has filed in his Palm Beach County case. In it, he claims that prosecutors withheld evidence that would help him defend himself. Suspected serial killer Robert Hayes, in quarantine, appeared via Zoom in a Palm Beach County courtroom just briefly. He'd hoped to make his case, but there were technical issues. Mr. Hayes, I thought in the past that the deputies had the ability to... Uh, to do something with the hardware out there to get you to activate the microphone, but that's not the case. Hayes is accused of murdering Rachel Bay in 2016 by strangling her. Palm Beach County deputies say a rape kit revealed Hayes' DNA. So we have Rachel Bay's DNA and Robert Hayes' DNA. It's more likely that the DNA sample is Rachel Bay and Robert Hayes than Rachel Bay and any other human on the planet. Genetic genealogy solved Bay's murder and linked Hayes to the murders of three more women in Daytona Beach from 2005 to 2006. Those women had been shot to death. Had we not done this, we're pretty sure that he would have killed again. Hayes has pleaded not guilty, and in his motion to dismiss, he claims investigators withheld cell phone information that showed he was in a different area from the location of the murder. At the same time, a witness allegedly told police he saw Bay alive. Hayes admits to having sex with Rachel Bay that night, but claims he didn't kill her. Investigators disagree. We have been able to take what we believe is a serial killer off the streets. And Robert Hayes will be back in court in Palm Beach County later this month to argue his motion to dismiss. Prosecutors down in Volusia County, where the other murders happened, are seeking the death penalty. They say that he targeted prostitutes for many years. Jesse? Let's break it down. Uh, Brian, this is a very interesting case for a lot of reasons, but right now he's requesting something called a Nelson hearing. What exactly is this and how does it typically play out? Yeah, so Jesse, a Nelson hearing in Florida is an inquiry that the defendant would ask the judge and say, hey, I don't think that this guy or girl next to me, that being the lawyer, is doing a good enough job. Job, I think they're ineffective, and I may want to represent myself. In a Nelson hearing, the judge will have a searching inquiry to see both what's going on between the lawyer and the defendant, and will make a decision as to whether or not that lawyer is ineffective and whether or not they should be replaced. Terry, this one's a bit different for a lot of reasons, but Hayes drafts this handwritten motion. I mean, what did you think of that? I actually read the handwritten motion, and I was impressed. You know, he has a degree in criminal justice, and it actually shows he used well-formed sentences. There weren't any misspellings. He used legalese. I mean, for instance, one of the things he said was it's well-documented by the superior court that all agents and the government, like the prosecution or the police, have a perpetual burden to provide exculpatory evidence to the accused. That's quite well-written, and he formed these arguments that were well formed. So kudos to him. Well, Anjanette, we have him charged in relation to four women, but my understanding is there's a potential other victim, Stacy Gage, shot dead as well. He didn't get charged in connection with her death. Why is that? And what do we know about how that could affect his current case? Yeah, we don't really know how it could impact the current prosecutions in Volusia County and Palm Beach County, but we know that police were actively investigating at the time that the indictment was announced. They were still actively investigating his connection to Stacey Gage's murder. 
Now, her body had decomposed quite a bit by the time it was found, but she was also shot with the same caliber of weapon as the other three victims in Volusia County. So, you know, they, there's a connection there. They've said he is connected to that crime, but whether or not they'll ever be able to get the evidence to actually charge him in that case, that, that just remains to be seen. Yeah, it's a disturbing case to follow, and it's gonna be interesting to see which way it ultimately carries out. Let's switch gears, though, because rock legend Rod Stewart and his son are reportedly expected to take a plea deal in a simple battery case out of Florida. The Palm Beach Police Department says the singer and his son got into an altercation at the Breakers Beach Resort on New Year's Eve in 2019. The two reportedly weren't allowed into a party when Sean Stewart shoved a security guard and the rock star threw a punch. Now, security footage apparently captured the incident, but that has not yet been made public. A hearing has been set for March 26th when the case is likely to be resolved. Former Los Angeles Dodgers pitcher Scott Erickson is facing a charge of reckless driving and a hit and run crash that killed two boys last year. The LA County Sheriff's Office says a family of six was crossing the road around 7 p.m. on September 29, 2020. The mother saw two speeding cars and was able to grab two of her children. Tragically, though, two brothers, eight and 11 years old, were struck and killed. The drivers fled and one was arrested and charged with murder and vehicular manslaughter. The sheriff's office says that Erickson was the second driver. He's scheduled to be arraigned on March 16th, and we'll see where that goes. All right, still ahead on Law & Crime Daily, a prosecutor's request to move a high-profile case out of her office. But first, the disturbing video of a young girl handcuffed, held down, and pepper sprayed. The police response and calls for action next. Newly released police body cam video shows officers restraining a nine-year-old girl, handcuffing her and spraying her with pepper spray. Nine Rochester, New York police officers responded to a call of family trouble on Friday. Officials say that they were told the girl was suicidal. The officers are seen on camera trying to get the girl into a patrol car, but she repeatedly kicked and pulled at them. That's when an officer is heard saying, quote, just spray her at this point. The girl actually cries out for her father. Now here's the video and we warn you, it is disturbing. You're not gonna run away from me, okay? Cause I I'm gonna have to chase you, okay? And I got like six other cars coming to chase you. I don't care. All right? I don't care. Well, come and talk to me, please. Oh, I don't want you. Go have a seat. No, I want my dad! I'm not gonna run off. I want my dad! Yes, you're gonna be fine. I got I want my dad. I'm not getting into no car till I see my dad. Here, just stop for a second. I want my dad. Stand up. 247. I'm in the car. I want my dad. No. Stop here. Stop. Wait, can I just please get the snow off of me? I'll get the snow off of you. Get in the car. You've had your chance. Get in the car now, okay? Okay? You've had your chances. What are you doing? What are you dad. doing? I want you're my You're gonna go to jail now too. You're up. Stop! Sit up! No! You're acting like a child. I wanna go Stop. get him a child to my dad. I'm gonna go get him. Now sit back. I will fix it. I will fix it. We need to why don't we separate my daughter? I just said I wanna see my dad. Come on. Come on, please Put your legs down. It's your last chance. Just pray. Just here at this point. Stop! Stop! Dear. Stop! I got her. I got her. That's tough to watch. Uh, Brian, w I have to ask you, the use of pepper spray, you know, as opposed to some other means, could it be necessary here when you're dealing with noncompliance, but you are dealing with noncompliance of a juvenile, not an adult? So, Jesse, from a legal standpoint, the law would actually say pepper spray is much like any other use of force, and it is necessary, necessary, I use air quotes, for noncompliance. But even in the video, when you see this young girl and they're yelling at her because they're annoyed, they're frustrated, 
They're saying, stop acting like a child. And she rightfully yells back, I am a child. And it boils down again to officers feeling that they can use force when someone is not following their instruction. It's a nine-year-old girl crying for her father, and you're going to pepper spray her into compliance? That should not be legal. That needs to change. Well, Terry, should the police have even responded? Because reportedly, this girl was suicidal. Were they the appropriate department to come there? Well, you hit it on the head, Jesse. No, they were not the appropriate department to respond. They should have sent a mental health crisis response team. Because if she were suicidal, there should be someone to talk to her, not to handcuff her, pepper spray her, throw her in the car. And the other thing is, they should be thinking about the mental development of a child versus an adult. There have been many studies to show that adults are very different than children. Children are not just little adults, and you have to deal with them separately and differently. So this was horrible on so many levels, and it was extremely difficult to watch the way they responded to this nine-year-old little girl. Brian, real quick, 30 seconds. What could happen to the officers involved in this incident? More likely than not, there's going to be a civil suit. Perhaps they'll be off duty. But like I said, they follow the books in the sense that the law and the procedures allow them to do this for noncompliance. But of course, there's a growing pushback on the use of force, especially against young children. This could change in New York City. And it's just fascinating that this was all ca caught on camera. Now everybody sees it. I mean, I haven't seen a video like that. It's really, really disturbing. All right, coming up on Long Crime Daily, while the, while the prosecutor overseeing one of the Rayshard Brooks case is asking for it to be moved out of her office. Plus, two inmates go from wanted fugitives to newly booked into the county jail, the statewide manhunt, and the tip that led investigators to their big break. Still ahead. Welcome back, everybody. The newly elected district attorney overseeing the Rayshard Brooks case wants it off her workload and transferred to another prosecuting attorney. Officials say Brooks was shot and killed last summer in a Wendy's parking lot by Atlanta police officer Garrett Rolfe. Rolfe is awaiting trial on murder and aggravated assault charges. District attorney Fawny Willis beat out incumbent Paul Howard last year, and she reportedly is now asking the Georgia Attorney General's office to refer Rolfe's case out of her office because Howard used the case in political ads. Howard was criticized for announcing his decision to charge the officer just five days after the shooting. After Mr. Brooks was shot for some period of two minutes and 12 seconds, uh, there was no medical attention applied to Mr. Brooks. Uh, but when we examined the videotape and in our discussions with witnesses, during the two minutes and 12 seconds that Officer Rolf actually kicked Mr. Brooks while he laid on the ground, while he was there fighting for his life. The other officer, Officer Brosnan, actually stood on Mr. Brooks's shoulders while he was there struggling for his life. The demeanor of the officers immediately after the shooting did not reflect any fear or danger of Mr. Brooks, but their actions really reflected other kinds of emotions. All right, let's get into this. Terry, was it the right decision by Willis to have the case transferred and who would take over? I don't think this was the right decision. I think that no matter where this case goes, it's going to be difficult. You know, the claim is that Howard, the predecessor prosecutor, he rushed to charge, and he didn't use a grand jury. He didn't wait for the Georgia Bureau of Investigation to finish its investigation. And it was a very publicly tried case, so to speak. And so I think no matter where it goes, it's going to be controversial, and I think it's going to be difficult. And I think she's just throwing a hot potato to another office. Brian, does the decision by Willis in any way taint or affect the prosecution of Rolf? It is going to affect. I, I slightly disagree with Terry, and I only say slightly because she is right. The case is tainted by the way uh, Howard dealt with his case, and the fish kind of stinks from the head down. This, although it might be putting a Band-Aid on a cancer, 
uh, is a some kind of a way to redeem this office and redeem this case and have some fresh hands to start off. Well, Terry, what happens to Howard? Because I know he's facing this GBI investigation, but did he do anything where he could face repercussions in either a civil or ethical arena? Well, he definitely is facing repercussions in an ethical arena. The Ethics Committee has already charged him with over a dozen claims. I mean, he's got some tax claims related to this. He's used funds in his own personal account. So he's definitely got some issues here, even if they aren't technically related to this case specifically. And, you know, one other thing I'll say, he's also got civil charges against him for sexual harassment. So mm -hmm. I think that's the whole reason he actually lost his reelection. But he's got a lot of charges to face here. Well, I'll be curious to see where the case goes because, you know, there's a lot of eyeballs on what happens in Atlanta. All right, when we come back, the manhunt that ended in a cotton field, how police captured two escaped inmates after a five-day long chase. That's up next. Two inmates are back in custody after escaping prison and leading authorities on a dramatic chase. Authorities say David Harmon and John Charpiet broke out of an Arizona state complex, prison complex last week. The pair are believed to have stolen tools from the prison to cut through a fence. A $70,000 reward had been offered for their capture, but they apparently didn't get far in five days on the run because a local man out driving in Coolidge, which is just 14 miles down the road from the prison, spotted them in their prison wear in a cotton field. The man called 911, and agents with the U.S. Marshals moved it. Moved it. Get on the ground now! Get on the ground now! Get on the fucking ground! You good, Daddy? Yeah. Oh. Okay. Give me another arm! Give me another arm! Give me another arm! There we go. We're good. We're good. Now, just before they were captured, the duo are accused of attacking a woman and trying to steal her vehicle. During the course of this investigation and uh, attempt to recapture, over 800 houses were searched in a period of 16 hours by the members of these agencies that you see standing here in this room. There was not a complaint. Uh, there was just, just a team effort. They understood how dangerous these guys were. When you look at the record of both of these subjects, one of them is a home invasion rapist, while the other is a molester of children ranging from ages seven to four years old. These were bad people we wanted to get off the street. The defendants were booked into the county jail, and the local prosecutor says that more charges are expected. They would not uh, obey commands. Uh, at one point, both of them said, just shoot me. They were both asking uh, for uh, the Coolidge PD officers and the deputy marshals to kill them. They would run, walk, run, walk away from the officers. They obviously weren't in very good shape, so they weren't running very fast or walking very fast. So uh, at that point, non-lethal electric shock weapons were used, also known as tasers, on the individuals. Uh, they were put into custody and, uh, and eventually transported uh, uh, to uh, the Coolidge Police Department and then from there uh, for processing and, and uh, further investigation. I spoke to the two Maricopa County judges who sentenced these two individuals uh, because when, when they escaped from prison, Obviously, there is a major concern with our judges who have tough jobs, and uh, they were notified this morning that uh, they were under custody, and, uh, and I know they, they felt uh, very relieved also. Well, t well, Terry, now that these men have been apprehended, what charges could they face? You know, escaping from prison, that's another criminal offense. So in Arizona, they could be charged with first-degree escape because 
they actually injured someone in the process, and that's a class four felony, and they could be sentenced to an additional, so it's going to be consecutive, not concurrent, an additional sentence of up to three years. And the other thing, Jesse, is they really could be put in a maximum security area now that we know that they try to escape. And that wouldn't be so surprising. But let me ask you, Brian, this could be surprising, because if you go to the prison, are they legally liable for anything after these two men escaped? I mean, after all, it was their job to keep them in prison. So are they liable for anything they did on the outside? Oh, the prison could absolutely be on the hook for any kind of damage or harm that these two um, committed when they got out. There's two ways of looking at this cause and effect, meaning but for what the prison did, this harm, like the stealing of a car or injury of an individual would not have occurred, or what's called proximate cause. You think about it like a chain of events. If you didn't do this, then this wouldn't have happened, then this wouldn't have happened, and they wouldn't have stolen my car. And those are two ways that the prison could be liable. And Terry, let me ask you this. You, you mentioned it. What safeguards need to be put in place by the prison? Maybe that weren't put in there the first time so that these two don't escape again. Well, clearly they have to have in increased security procedures, but you heard on the tape there that the police officers weren't in good shape. So maybe one of the things we should be doing is making sure that these officers are in better shape to go after these prisoners who've escaped. But yeah, they just need more security and better security overall at these prisons. Well, I'm looking at them and I'm thinking we are never going to see them again on the outside. At least that's what we're all hoping for because those two are just trouble. All right, everybody. Thank you for joining us here on Law and Crime Daily. We'll see you next time as we discuss justice in America.